Welcome to Wild and Exposed. Your number one adventure, nature, and outdoor photography podcast. Wild and Exposed is hosted by Michael Morrow, Ron Hayes, and Jason Lopez. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of Wild and Exposed. We're here this week with Jason Loftus coming to us from Utah. How's it going up there, Jason? It's going good. I actually got some weather coming in. Uh, <laughs> it's going to get down to a high of 72, and we're talking about the 1st of July, right? So pretty crazy, but yeah, it's going good. What's it been like so far? It's been mid-90s, um, pretty hot, pretty dry. Um, so it's much needed, the weather that's coming. We need the rain. We need the water. But yeah, it's been uh, <laughs> it's been it's been rough shooting conditions, but um, I've been able to get out and do a little bit of shooting too, so it's been nice. What have you been shooting? So I had an opportunity to go out and shoot a, a local uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Kelly Elmer. He actually had access to a private land burrow for some burrowing owls, and the burrow that we were on had eight babies. So with the two adults and the eight babies, it's been pretty fun to sit on that thing every night and with nobody else around and nobody else to bother them. They've gotten pretty used to us being there and they just do their thing and we're at pretty, pretty close range and not impacting them at all. And they are just pretty cute little guys, man. The, those burrowing house have some really interesting, uh, uh, fa facial expressions and, uh, personalities, you know, and a lot of that comes out when you're in there, um, playing around with them. So, so that was a pretty awesome opportunity, actually, and I appreciate him a ton for letting me come and uh, participate in that. But but it's tough when you're doing that because you're sitting there from about five o'clock in the afternoon till dark, and those first couple of hours with the sun beating on you is pretty pretty rough. But <laughs> what's your shooting ratio from like stills to video? So in this situation, because I still didn't have my uh, my Sony, and I don't I don't know if we've talked about this on the show or not yet, but I my wife and my family got me a. Uh, an ND filter for my Sony lens, but my Sony lens is in the shop getting the collar adjusted. Um, and so I don't have a way to shoot good video in the daytime still right with the, with the brighter light. So anyways, with that being said, I probably shoot in the last 45 minutes of the day. I've been shooting quite a bit of video. And then the first part of the day when the light was a lot better, you know, shooting mostly stills. So probably taking around, I don't know, a thousand images and probably 50 or 60 videos each day sweet so, you're right yeah. there by really right stuff why didn't you just go buy a a collar from them do they make them for that two well, to six? Yeah, they they make a replacement foot but they don't make oh, okay. a replacement collar yeah so. gotcha uh, hey so i had one other question for you i mean we're going down a rabbit hole already but that's all right <laughs> it's what we do <laughs> you said you sent your sony lens in did you join the sony pro program whatever that is i joined it i don't remember what it's called but I, did you join that and does that put your lens at the front of the list or anything like that? Or did you just send it in and you got to wait? So right now I just sent it in and I got to wait. I need to get on that for sure. Um, I'm not hundred percent sure if I qualify. I don't know what their qualifications are for that, but the local camera shop I use here, Fars Jewelry, they actually have a, a camera bar as well. And they, they're very good with support and stuff. And, um, I'm a big believer in supporting your local camera shops for a lot of reasons, but, um, I just need to work with them and and uh, see if I can get signed up on that. Um, at this point, it's just kind of out there in the wind and hoping I get it back soon. But the, the one of the reasons, real quick, why I say I'm a big fan of supporting the local camera shops, in this very situation, um, they're very willing to let me borrow one of their two to 600 lenses if it's not being rented. So if, even though it's out of the shop, in, in most places you're not going to get that benefit. So because I'm supporting them and do that, there's customer services of such that if I need to go grab a two to 600 and it's available, they're more than willing to let me do that while it's in the shop getting repaired. So so then most of the stuff on your, for the owls was your 500. I'm using my Nikon D850 and my 500 Prime. Um, I was throwing the, the TC on there, the 1.4 teleconverter, um, and was able to get some pretty neat, really tight stuff in the light some really neat light situations and actually quite a bit of a, of a flying around stuff too. So those burrowing owls are pretty, <laughs> they're super active. Those adults are trying to feed eight, you know, eight mouths. That's pretty, that's pretty tall order. Um, so got a lot of really cool flying stuff, which is something I'd never really gotten a burrowing house. 
So, but yeah, I'm excited about some of this stuff. I need to get, get on some editing now. But okay, I got one more <laughs> question. Sorry, I'm coming. Dude. Yeah, I'm no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> What's the coolest insect that they came in with? Is it like a, when I've shot them before? It's like humongous grasshoppers and really ugly beetles that you're like, ah, man, I wouldn't even want to ever have to eat that. But yeah, so out there, most of the bugs they were bringing in were just crickets and grasshoppers. And most of the bugs I got, you know, you get the adult flying into the to the burrow with the babies all waiting. And um, when those when those adults land, they've got that cricket sticking in their mouth. It's kind of cool. Um, but then those little babies, they just mug those parents. I mean, there's just it's crazy how much they attack them. So a lot of the times the adults will land, you know, 10, 15 feet away from the burrow. And then the fastest couple, you know, outlets run out there and they're the ones that get the get the cricket. Um, but we actually did see, and I didn't get, it was just of such that I could not get video or, or, um, a picture of it, but they actually are hunting voles over there too. So I don't think you see a lot of burrowing owls with, uh, you know, mice or voles in their mouths. So that was kind of a unique opportunity, but I didn't, I didn't get any good shots of it, unfortunately. So that was kind of my goal is once I saw they were hunting some voles, I was really hoping to get that shot, but it just never came together this time. So awesome. Michael, you're coming to us from Colorado. How about you? You getting uh, out well, or just last... riding bike? <laughs> I've been riding my bike a lot. <laughs> so this COVID, everybody talks about gaining weight during COVID. I've actually lost weight just because it's like, so I just don't have a lot of stuff to do. So I just hop on my bike and go ride for a couple hours and then come back. And But I have been working on a new project, which is, I don't think we've talked about it. I just told Jason prior to the podcast what I was working on, but I think it's something that we could put out now. Just It's not ready for prime time yet but it probably within the next 30 days we'll have it out but we're working on a um everybody's familiar with the rocky mountain arsenal national wildlife refuge well i wouldn't say everybody but a lot of people are it's a pretty cool little loop that you can drive in an urban kind of an urban wildlife refuge so it sits between denver and dia the international airport and i believe i used to know these numbers exactly but i don't know for sure right now but I think it's 26 square miles of refuge and it was a super fun site so that was so it had this they used to create herbicides and pesticides and all kinds of really not so nice stuff out there as well as some of the stuff for for wartime stuff so they had this huge buffer zone around it which you know in all these super fun sites these buffer zones become really awesome wildlife areas because they have this significant area with nobody in it so wildlife just prospers in those types of areas and several years ago the cleanup started on the whole place the easiest thing to do with those kind of places is turn them into some sort of refuge because you never really want to build houses out there or do anything like that so this and the refuge being that close to an urban area is a great opportunity for local urban type people to learn about wildlife we um several years ago we produced a video for the visitor center just to teach people when they go into the visitor center, the history of the arsenal and then a lot of the wildlife opportunities out there. And last year I was asked to update that video. So I started on it and then as time went by, you know, like it always does just cranking along. And by the end of the year, I hadn't got it all fin finalized yet. And they changed their whole scope out there. They're like, you know what? We want to do a podcast. Essentially it's not a podcast. It's more of a audio tour but there's mile markers all the way out there on that drive. And so at each mile, we've created an audio tour now that you'll be able to download through iTunes. And then when you hit mile one, it'll say what is significant about mile one. When you hit mile two, what's significant between mile one and mile two and mile two and mile three. You know, so it's kind of a cool thing. So that's what I've been working on lately. And so it's all audio. So I've been out there. Um, I... It's super hard. Like I said, it's an urban area. So recording audio out there is really difficult because you've got airplanes and, you, you know, it's good during COVID because we don't have as many airplanes in the air. But you've got major highways that, you know, the road noise will travel for a long ways. And so getting really good natural audio is tough out there. So I've been trying to get prairie dogs and, and bison right now just to add to it. But we've got coyotes, we've got frogs, we've got ducks, we've got lots of songbirds all kinds of cool stuff that help illustrate that audio story as people are actually driving through the arsenal. So that's been my focus for the last couple of weeks. In addition to those hummingbirds that 
that I was filming. And I just got a note from my buddy the other day, those hummingbirds. You know how those nests are made out of um, basically uh, silk, spider silk, or spider web material. You know, they start expanding, they start expanding. As those birds get bigger and bigger, those nests start start pooching out. And he was he sent me a message yesterday. He said, man, this nest is, I don't know how much longer they're going to be able to stay in there. And then this morning he sent me a text and said, they're gone. So it was like 18 to 24 days and boom, they're out of there. Mm-hmm. So I think they'll stick around that area for a while. But And mom will continue to feed them a little bit. But I think uh, it was a successful nest so far. Good. That's awesome. I've been shooting local. I've got um, a fox den that's right in town. We've never, we've always had one kind of in this area right on the edge of town, but I've been out trying to get it. It's in this wood pile. It's not super photogenic, but just to get it for the local newspaper and, uh, you know, to get some urban fox images. And then uh, curlews, we've got nesting curlews around right now that have young ones that are starting to get pretty close to fledging they're on the ground anyway so it's it's easy to get some images but that's what i've been kind of messing around with i'm excited to introduce cameron roxbury cameron's coming to us from central alaska where he is a an apache helicopter pilot and this is a photography show but i'm kind of excited to talk a little bit about that too but Cameron, I know you've probably been out shooting, but what we've been doing with our guests recently, what we're going to ask you first is what is your favorite outdoor experience? So ever? far, today. Ever. So, far. so far. Well, good morning. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here <laughs> with you guys. And uh, Thanks for joining us. Yeah. So um, my most exciting outdoor experience, I guess I would have to go with that Lynx, um, only because uh, the rarity and... Uh, how much it meant to me because how much work I, I was putting into actually finding one. And then the irony of the encounter. Um, I, I put out a YouTube video about it, but I'll, I'll give a little recap. Um, I had spent the whole day in Denali National Park and I was there for uh, ptarmigan and caribou and just trying to document um, early springtime with the plumage change in the ptarmigan and you could get the velvet growing in the antlers on the caribou. And, you know, I had spent the mo- majority of the day doing that. And uh, it was like 11, 1130 at night. And uh, the sun is still staying up for uh, 20 hours. Um, so I was like, you know, I'll head home. I had a good day. I got I got what I came down for. I'm driving out of the park, and I officially leave Denali, and I uh, start heading home. And uh, no exaggeration, I got the windows down, and I start hearing a, a scream. I'm like, oh, man. Like, I, I feel like I know that sound. So I, I, I stop the car. The windows are down. I'm, I'm hanging out the window, and I hear the scream again. And sure enough, I'm like, that's a that's a lynx. So, you know, throw the car off to the side of the road, put it in park, roll the windows up, grab the gear, and, and I just start trudging off into the forest. And sure enough, it was a, a young male lynx, and he was calling for a mate, just wailing, screaming his head off. So um, I sat down, and uh, within the next five to ten minutes, he actually came up over the hill. And he, uh, he was calm, and he was doing natural uh, calling, and he just sat there, and he called for a good five, ten minutes, and he allowed me to get uh, some really – really special images for me. So that would probably be my, uh, my most favorite wildlife experience. Well, and everybody's got to go watch his video on YouTube because I watched it actually just prior to this podcast. But if you have never heard a lynx, you would never ever in a million years say that's a lynx making that sound, right? Can you describe, I mean, obviously people can go to YouTube and, and listen to it, but or there's probably, you had it on your phone, right? You had an app or you had something where you were actually. So in all my wisdom, when I'm shooting the video of this this cat calling, I have it in slow-mo. So I didn't record any actual audio. So I got I got the, the, the video of him doing the call, but I didn't get the audio. So unfortunately, I just, I go to YouTube and I, I had to pull just a, a random sound clip of the Lynx call. But um, the other times we've heard it, and if I had to describe it, it would be, um, it would be a, it almost sounds like a, a child screaming, like literally like a child screaming. So we'll be out shooting the Aurora late at night in the winter time. And you'll just hear this blood curling scream out in the forest. It sounds like a child screaming. And if you don't know that it's a lynx, it really makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. So that, that's the best way I could describe it is like a child screaming. I think you're right. But I think there's a lot of people out there that would just say 100% it's Sasquatch. <laughs> 
<laughs> that too. That too. It was a scotch in them woods. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A mountain lion is actually pretty similar. It sounds like a, a woman scream. And that's when you hear it and you don't know it it's the same way. It's it's pretty eerie. But those the images that you got were I mean, he gave you some up close and personal opportunities. And it, when you go to YouTube and watch this clip, uh, Cameron's got several images in the clip that you can kind of see what he could see. And when he was shooting, and as was it toward the end of daylight? Um, it was. It was almost right? pitch. It was. It was almost pitch black. It was 11:30, and I'm in a dark spruce forest. And um, in the video, I talk about how I, I'm not a big proponent of ISO. I, I, I try to keep my ISO pretty low. I cap it pretty early. But uh, in, in this instance, it didn't matter. I was willing to go to 25,000. This was my first Lynx encounter. So I cranked the, the ISO all the way up. And uh, believe it or not, I feel like the images came out they came out pretty decent. But uh, yeah, the ambient light was was next to none. The sun was already already setting. And uh, like I said, I was in that dark forest. But it, it worked out. So so the the video, when you do watch it, you know, we talk about Topaz all the time, right? And that was the part of his video that he was able to go into that whole topaz kind of like um, it's almost like a well, how to how do you it wasn't really how to use topaz as much as it was look at what it did for this picture kind of thing right oh and I was um, it was that was actually my first image that I've ever ran through that software and I, I downloaded the software specifically for the recovery of that image and uh, I'm sold made a believer out of me guys so I uh, I've been using topaz a lot now it's like I said in the video it really changed how I uh, or the, the length of time I'm, I'm out there shooting in uh, the different lighting situations. And if I remember correctly, I think you had run your camera. You are using the D850, and you had run it up to 4,000, right? ISO? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. I was at 4,000 ISO at 600 F4, and then I want to say shutter speed's as low as 1 one sixtieth handheld with a 600. So <laughs> out of about 300 shots, two or three of them are sharp. Okay, so do yeah. you own a tripod? I do, I oh, okay, do, good. but in, in this situation, it was like I just grabbed the gear and, and headed off into the forest after the, the sound. That's awesome. a good experience, and the coolest thing is is anybody can go watch this video because it's on YouTube, and it's just awesome to see that what you were able to experience and the importance of audio and the importance of paying attention. I mean, you had to be on blacktop when you were rolling down the road with your windows down, right? Because rolling on gravel, it would have been hard to hear that, but... Yep, I was I was on hardball and uh, I I was just accelerating to head home, and uh, that's when I that's when I had heard it. And luckily, I had the windows down. It was a beautiful evening, so uh, I just it all the stars kind of aligned. If that makes sense, I wish I could say that I had tracked them for ten miles and you know sat on them, but I just got really lucky. More often than not, I think that's the case. Yep. And then the irony is, you know, I went camping last weekend and uh, storm rolled in really hard, so uh, we left we left at two thirty in the morning and drove all the way home. And guess what's sitting in my driveway when I get home? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Another cat. So I've just been getting really lucky lately. You know, Next. one of my good friends lives in Anchorage up on the hill there. And he um, he's kind of the highest house in that particular area of the of the hillside there. Okay. And he gets links a lot through his property. And he got that whole... The reason I was familiar with the sound is because he regularly gets links and last year he had a mating pair in his backyard and he's just out there with his iphone filming for like 10 minutes just i mean it's the clip so big that and he doesn't know how to edit video on on his phone so i i, I ask him all the time hey just send me just 30 seconds of that but when i go up there this year and i see him i'm gonna grab his phone and get it but it's just when you have a male and a female and they're both making sounds and they're you know in that mating kind of thing it is so cool and so interesting to watch and this the dynamics going on is pretty awesome oh, i still i still cry a little bit every time you talk about that because i literally had just left anchorage and when i landed in seattle my phone blows up and there's cell phone images of a lynx yeah i was it was nuts it's crazy what he gets up there. I mean, I should probably just sit at his house for a month and just... In fact, when I was shooting for Animal Planet for that particular show a couple of years ago, they wanted snowshoe hares, and that's what I did. I just went up to his house and just sat on his deck 
with my big camera sitting there and I would just sit there all day and wait for whatever. I got all kinds of cool different things and he gets so many, he, he's very much into wildlife. In fact, he was a wildlife photographer before he retired and he just has the, you know, he's kind of set up his yard for, with some bird feeders and lots of native plants. And so it, it works really good. He gets bear, he gets grizz and black bear a lot, lots of moose. He's actually had wolverines go through his property, lynx, just everything. It's just amazing. And he has trail cameras up everywhere. So it's kind of cool because you're not always going to be on point and be able to see everything, right? But with the trail cameras, you can say, oh, look, a wolverine went through. Or look, there was a, a sow with three cubs that went through or whatever. So pretty cool. It kind of it kind of kills the whole animal planet magic, doesn't it? To know you're sitting up there on the deck with a Perrier and... <laughs> that's how we're getting that's how we're getting this footage it was the only it was that i mean i'm not they're only giving me so much money per day and i'm like i, I gotta figure out the spot that's going to be the most productive and i figured that was a lot better to chase snowshoes there you know there's been years in denali where snowshoes are just like a dime a dozen right yeah. but it's not been that way for a while well i don't know i haven't been there in a couple of years so i don't know what the population is like currently but so actually, if I can just hop in real quick, actually, the, the snowshoe hair right now is um, there's a seven year ebb and flow. I don't know if, if anybody's kind of I was explained to me by a, a ranger down in Denali. It's a seven year ebb and flow with the, the snowshoe hairs and then the lynx population chasing it. And uh, this year is the boom. So the snowshoe hairs are at their max, which, you know, breeds so more lynx. And next year's the lynx year. huh? Yep. It's and then, you know, it'll go down for the next seven years. But next year, year and a half, two years, probably be a pretty good chance to. uh get some cat images. So when we used to do that Denali permit, you know, the photo permit, and you could drive into the park, there was a couple of years that we had where it was the boom year. You could not drive down the road without, I mean, it was, you just had to go so slow if you didn't want to run over a, a snowshoe. And you know, those buses that you talked about in your video, Cameron, those guys can't stop, you know, they're just cruising. So there's like dead snowshoe hares on the road everywhere, which is actually like, so you see lots of wolves, you see lots of lynx, you see lots of all kinds of predators because they're just going after the low-hanging fruit and they'll just go get a dead, you know, lots of fox just getting snowshoes right off the road. So I guess if that's the case, it might be worth the trip to Denali this year. Um, have you, has anybody read, read you guys in on what's going on with Denali this year with uh, all, everything going on? You know, yeah. fill us in because I had a buddy tell me, but did Polychrome pass, did the did the road slough off or what did part of the road fall off last winter? It did. Uh, they had to do uh, DOT had to do some major repairs. Uh, they did get it fixed, thankfully. But uh, the regulations that the park's running right now, it's uh, it's almost like a once in a lifetime opportunity. So it's a little bit of a, a silver lining in this uh, dark storm cloud we're all going through. But what they managed to do is they've actually opened the road to all residents. Um, you do have to pay a permit pass and it's fifteen dollars per day. And it allows you to drive to mile 30. So right there at the um, Teclinica the Teclinica River. Yep, right at the Teclinica River, you can drive there for $15 a day. And then there's five weekends out of the summer that if you pay, I forget how much it is, but they allow you to go all the way to uh, Wonder Lake. You can drive all the way to the Isleson Visitor Center. So um, it's, a, it's an incredible summer for residents or anybody who's able to get to Alaska and wants to experience Denali and not have to take the bus. Um, it's, it's been pretty, it's been pretty good. How many people can a resident throw in the back of their truck? So you, it's, you pay by person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you just pay by person. So you, you have a big suburban, you just pay 15 bucks per person and you all can go as many times as you want. Do you have to be a resident or is that open to folks outside too? I think it's anybody. Um, it's just, uh, when they were selling it, they were selling it as vacation at home for residents, but I, I don't, I think it's for anybody. So you've got probably one of the more unique <laughs> side gigs of uh, anyone that we've ever had on the show but how did you transition into wildlife photography with that being your that being your job and then of course how did you end up in Alaska absolutely um so I always say wildlife photography found me it was a uh, it was definitely something that I was not actively searching for <laughs> so um I guess I can I can go back to 2018 I was in a uh, flight school and uh I, I really hadn't done any photography up into that um, other than just know your basic cell phone pictures, but I was in flight school and I remember, you know, every day we'd go out to the flight line and, you know, there's a lot of downtime out there when you're waiting to go fly and train. 
And I remember sitting back and just being like, man, I really wish I could document this. Like it, this would be a cool experience for me to um, get a, a nice camera document and uh, have these memories forever. So uh, that's that's what I did is I uh, believe, yeah, my first camera was a Nikon D7200. And I splurged a little bit and I got the the Nikons uh, 200 to 500. And um, I just started taking pictures around the airfield strictly to document what was going on um, with no intent on ever transitioning to anything more serious or especially not wildlife at the time. But that was the setup it was just a, the kit lens with the D7200 kit and then the 200 to 500. And I just started taking pictures and then um, it kind of snowballed out of control. And I, I fell in love with it. And it was all aviation photography at first because it was kind of what I was just surrounded with. It was what was going on. So I um, really honed my skills uh, taking pictures of helicopters. Well, I pan forward six months and I come down with orders to Alaska. It's going to be my first duty station after flight school. And I remember being bummed, actually being a little upset that I was uh, getting going to Alaska because, you know, the flying up here is uh, it's a little bit different. Um, a little bit more weather, a little bit more darkness. There's just some some different factors. So I was bummed out. Uh, come to come to terms with it, and uh, there I am at Bellingham, Washington, about to jump on a ferry to go up the Pacific Northwest coast to Alaska. And uh, had my camera, and I was like, I guess I'll just make the best of it. I'll, I'll shoot whatever's available. It wasn't four days later that I was 100% infatuated with all things wildlife photography, and and really haven't looked back since. <laughs> That's an awesome story. It is. And and you kind of exploded pretty quick. I mean, you've got a pretty good um, Instagram following. you got the YouTube channels up and running. And on there, like Mike alluded to earlier, you've got a lot of tutorials and, and also just experiential type clips on your YouTube channel. But it looks so like you've made good with it. Oh my goodness. I, like, I, like it was perfect. You alluded to earlier to <laughs> flying's almost become the nine to five, <laughs> just trying to, trying to get back out. But, um, huh. it's been, it's been really good. The YouTube thing for me was, um, I'm 100% university of YouTube taught. Everything I've learned was been, has been on YouTube and it just, it got to the point where I, uh, I felt like I had just enough to give back by no means. Am I an expert at any of this? It's just something that I've, uh, dove into. And if I learn something, I feel like somebody else might learn from it. I'll make a quick video. So that, that was kind of the idea behind the YouTube channel. The thing is, is your videos aren't, I mean, they're awesome. They're not short. They, they're what, I think I looked at most of them. They're average between maybe 14 and 18 minutes or something. So it's not so fast that you just like, oh, I want to see more, but it's just enough to actually learn something or uh, share an experience with you. And then it's, it's a, I think they're the perfect length. Oh, thank you. So I go back and forth, just like I'm sure a lot of people do. Like, does anybody really care what I'm doing for 15 <laughs> minutes? But uh, <laughs> the feedback's been pretty good. Um, I did want to stay, like like you alluded to, I did want to stay away from the gear centric YouTube channels, although those are awesome. There's just there's just a lot of them. So my my idea was just to, like you said, share experiences. Because uh, for me, at least as a wildlife photographer, that that's really what I'm I'm here for. I'm using it as you know the excuse just to be in nature and. Uh, I like to share that on the YouTube channel more than necessarily what gear I'm using or what settings I'm using. So how's it work with your job then? Do you, is it like a nine to five? I mean, I don't know. Being a Apache helicopter pilot, is that like a nine to five thing or is it <laughs> like, okay, I got two days a week as my weekend and the rest of the day I'm flying or how's that work? Yeah. We like to call it a, a, a five to nine is more, more what it really is. Um, but it really, it depends on the season up here in Alaska. Since I'm stationed up here, um, you know, during the, the winter times, below a certain temperature, it's just not, it's not smart for us to go flying in negative 50, you know, God forbid anything happens and you got to land somewhere. The, the weather itself will kill you. So um, that's kind of a slow time for us, the winter. Um, that gives me a good chance to get out there and uh, focus on some photography. But uh, it's really not consistent. So, you know, sometimes we're going to go do field training. Sometimes we're going to go do a rotation somewhere or, you know, something comes down the pipeline that we have to go do. But, um, I've just kind of made wildlife photography an escape for, for me. So every spare minute I bring my, my camera with me to work, I'll keep it in my flight locker. And, you know, during lunch hour, I'll grab it and go up Birch Hill, which is the big hill that kind of overlooks Fairbanks or yeah, my area in Fairbanks and, uh, just looking for anything. So, uh, just try to make the most out of it, go when I can. And, uh, it's been working out 
helps that Alaska is so abundant with wildlife, you know, just bringing your camera to work and going out on a lunch break could yield you a lynx or a, a, a moose or, you know, you never really know. Hey, Cameron, do you get to take your uh, camera with you when you go flying? Um, we'll go with no, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> is that the official loud. answer? We'll say that. <laughs> official answer is no. <laughs> I understand. But what is nice is uh, I'd be a liar if I said that I didn't uh, maybe mix some training time with some scouting time, some government-funded scouting time. <laughs> yeah it's hard not to right <laughs> so you know you got your phone on you and maybe you drop a pin or two come check it out on the weekend so how long will you be stationed in alaska or do you do you know that so i extended <laughs> the second i got up here and i, I spent a, a year up here i was like i'm gonna do anything i can to, to stay in this place so i uh, i've already extended i'm here at least until 2023 so uh, we'll see kind of how the career path plays out and if there's a, a chance for me to stick around a little bit longer. But um, what's cool is my wife is uh, she's also a pilot, but she's a pilot for the Alaska National Guard. So she's got roots up here. So um, that's always an option, something to look at in the future. We uh, we want to we want to end up here for sure. And having her set up in that that gig is uh, it's kind of the ultimate plan for us. So do you end up flying fixed wing too, or are you just strictly helicopter right now? So I do have my private fixed wing license, um, but for the military, I, I just, I only do rotary wing. It's kind of like one of those things where when it's your job, it's like the last thing you want to do on the weekends. It's like, Hey, let's go home and do more paperwork, you know? <laughs> so I, I tend not to do much flying, um, outside of, outside of just what the, the military wants me to do. Being young and being in Alaska and seeing the potential of having an aircraft, you know, like a super cub or, you know, a beaver or whatever you know, whatever you can afford. I mean, the places that you can go and the stuff that you could shoot with that sort of access is, is unbelievable, right? Because you, there's just not that potential for 90% of the population to ever, unless you want to pay for it, obviously what you can do. And a lot of people do do that. But if you had a plane sitting there, you could just go experience some crazy stuff if you with that sort of flexibility. Oh my goodness. I, you're 100% right. For me, I, I had to weigh the option. It was, um, you know, getting, getting a plane would be phenomenal, but, uh, I just, I don't want to tie up that, that little bit of free time that I may have with maintenance and, and figuring out how to, you know, keep it, keep it kept and where to hanger it. And it's just, it's almost like just a little bit of an extra, um, tie on me right now that, that I, I kind of sacrifice. But in the future, no, you're 100 percent right. If it's something that's feasible and you could uh, you can get away with having that, you can you can unlock doors that, like you said, the general population just can't even fathom. Jason got robbed of a trip up this summer, um, you know, with all these shutdowns and things. He was supposed to be up photographing bears. So it's nice that you got channels like yours that you can live vicariously through once in a while. Oh no. Stay tuned, Jason. Next week we're doing cat. My, we're going to go do some Brooks. Uh -huh. <laughs> awesome. Jason, you better just go get your COVID test and get up there. <laughs> I was supposed to leave next Sunday and um, it's really bumming me out right now. So, <laughs> Oh, I, I am sorry. Cause uh, I had a, a really big uh, musk ox trip canceled in March and I, I feel your pain. So have you driven that hall road? Um, so I was going to actually drive it last weekend, but um, fire season here, I'm sure you guys are all aware of, is, is pretty bad. Um, we, we have had record-breaking rainfall in the last few weeks, which has been really good at subsiding uh, the fires. But the Hall Road, um, I didn't want to get stuck up there. There was a really bad fire, and it was moving east to west. And I was like, with my luck, I'll go north. I'll go to do the Prudhoe Bay thing, and uh, I'll get stuck up there. So uh, against my better judgment, I didn't do it. And... Um, but no, I, I haven't. Short answer, I, I haven't been up there yet. But being there till 2023, that'll give you plenty of opportunity to do it, both in summer and winter. Oh, yeah. And I guess winter's the time to go. The mosquitoes right now, is like I'm sure you're positive of, are just awful. So uh, <laughs> going up there right now is just, oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, you can't. It's just unbearable. I mean, you say, oh, I can do that, and then you try it, and then it's like, no, I can't do that. And you're right. It's one of those things where, you know, you're, you're thinking about it. You're like, mosquitoes, really? That's not going to stop me from doing anything. And then you, you see Alaska mosquitoes, and you're like, oh, man. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what else you get a chance to photograph. I and mean, we heard the Lynx story. I mean, I'm sure, you know, and then if you guys watch the Lynx thing, there's stuff about uh, the caribou and then obviously the ptarmigan. But there's all kinds of stuff. What's, what's your favorite, like, uh, bear encounter so far? A uh, favorite bear encounter actually happened this season with a, a brown bear, also a Denali. Um, 
it was a it was a mama, it was a sow and a cub, and uh, she was on a moose carcass. And I'm not sure if if it was a moose kill or the moose had just passed and she just was scavenging on it. But um, right there, you know, uh, within, I would say, 100 yards of the road was a sow and a cub. And they were just hanging out on a moose carcass. And you could get all the behavior between the mom and the baby. And, you know, they would take turns. She'd watch her back while she ate. And then they would swap. And and I spent a good hour, two hours just watching, watching them feed on this moose carcass where they would be breaking the ribs. Where they they use you know the, the, their body weight and they get up on the ribs and they push down and, and it was just it was cool to experience all that and get the audio of the, the ribs cracking and 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 that that was cool that was probably my uh, my so far greatest bear encounter hopefully next week we'll uh, take the cake but we'll see yeah tell us how what that trip's gonna be like hey so you haven't been to Katmai yet I have not this will be my first my first time and then what are you guys doing are you flying out of homer or are you flying out of anchorage are you flying out of fairbanks what are you doing to get there so we're gonna um, we're gonna convoy down you and my wife are gonna we're gonna go camp down on the spit the homer spit and then uh take one of those flights out of homer into uh, katmai and then do the the brooks falls i know it's a pretty stereotypical alaska shot but i, I really really want to get the fish and bears just for me i just i've always really been fascinated with the fish and bears so to uh, get the chance to to capture that would just be a uh, be a bucket list shot for me for sure so how are you guys going to do that just for people that are listening because i don't think a lot of people well some people know and then some people don't you have the opportunity to camp out there but you also have the opportunity opportunity to stay at a lodge and then are you doing an extended day so it's like three or four days or are you just flying in for one day and then flying back out um it'll be the overnight at the lodge um so how it'll work is it it's a book tour just like i'm sure people have done for for other things but um there's there's uh a company down in Homer, the name is escaping me, but um, they fly you out on a float plane. It's a it's a 1.6 hour flight out of Homer on a float plane into Katmai, where you'll land, and then you go to a, a safety brief, um, obviously where they're going to tell you uh, the do's and don'ts of being uh, in bear country, and then from then they kind of just they release you for 24 hours. You know, you got the lodge, you got like a home base to set up at, but then you can go you can go to the platforms and you can see the fishing bears, or you can walk uh, shorelines and look for you know bears doing rooting or clams or whatever they're eating at the time. And then, uh, you know, you stay the night at the lodge and then you wake up and then you have just that morning to get out there and go photograph again before you load back up on the float plane and then and fly home. So it'll be a quick turnaround, but um, hopefully, fingers crossed, I timed it during the, the run, the salmon run. So hopefully we get the shot. And are they still doing the time limits on the on the platforms with the crowds being a little bit smaller now? You know, I, that... I don't know. I, re- I know I was reading, it was like, something quick too. It was like 15 minutes or, or something, yeah. something really fingers crossed short, but, um, I don't know. I think if you stay out there, you have a little bit more time because the day flights don't start coming in till later. But I, I know it was a, it was a, like you said, kind of a conservative limit of time. What else is uh, going really well right now is, um, some Eagle photography down there in Homer. Um, the COVID yeah, you thing just this had is a also... video about that, right? Yep. It's also been a, a result of, um, all the restrictions that are in place right now, um, the fishing, the, or at least the, um, recreational fishing tours are, are at an all time low. Understandably, there's just not a lot of tourism up here. So what that's done is that's allowed the commercial fishing just to boom. Um, so the place that I go in that area, um, is commercial fishing centric and it's not, it's, it's kind of by Homer, but it's, it's not necessarily there, but it's, um, it's a little beach, and in the video you'll see the beach. And I, I took some footage of uh, how this operation works. But uh, these commercial fishers, fisheries, they go out there and they um, they do their harvest for the day, and then they come in, and then before they get picked up out of the water, they they skin and they clean all their fish in the water, and then they get picked up by this big cat, pulls them out of the water, and they go about their day. But over time, the eagles have gotten accustomed to this this commercial this commercial food. So they show up every day at the same time and they, they sit in trees and they wait. So it's kind of like cherry picking, but, um, it's, it's just been working. So I'm going to go down there and and try to round out the Eagle portfolio a little bit more along with the bears. But, uh, so talk about that a little bit when you talk about portfolio, cause I noticed that when I did watch, I watched that video too about the Eagles. Um, I think there's a lot of younger photographers that really don't pay a lot of attention to building a portfolio of a specific species, which I think is pretty cool that you're doing that because a lot of people will go out and just say, okay, I'm just going to get this really awesome picture of whatever. And then they call it good. 
Whereas you're like, I want to capture behavior. I want the awesome pictures too, but I want to capture the behavior. I want to capture every age class. I want to capture different uh, things that they're feeding on, just everything. How did you get into that mindset? And is it just a personal interest or did you do a lot of studying to figure out that if I really want to create this whole life history of this particular animal, this is what I need to get. Um, am I allowed to shamelessly plug wild and expose podcast here? <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's honest to goodness. Like I said, uh, I haven't been doing this very long. So, um, everything I know is, is YouTube university or no exaggeration, this podcast. So uh, sitting back and listening to you guys talk about, um, you know, the glory shot is nice. Like we talk about all the time. It's always nice to have that beautiful backlit sunlit image, you know, where it's nice and golden and, and it's the, like we call it the cover magazine shot. But, um, I wanted to have more depth to uh, to my portfolio than that. Like I wanted to be able to do uh, a book if I needed to on one species. So uh, and listening to you guys talk about the importance of it, you know, especially when you go and start selling or you start marketing or you want to get yourself out there. Um, these people or these uh, publishers are going to want more than just the cover shot. You know, OK, cool. So you got the attention. Now you need some some something substantial, some something to uh, really further the story that you're trying to tell. So after listening to you guys and just kind of doing a little bit of my own research, I was like, that's that's the way to do it. If you want to be successful, you got to tell the whole story. So that was the idea. So how, what is your aspirations for, I mean, obviously having, being a pilot is pretty cool, right? Because you, there's a lot of opportunity, especially, well, not during COVID times, but prior to COVID, pilots were in high demand. And I don't know about helicopter specific, but certainly fixed wing all my friends up in alaska that were flying fixed wing had awesome opportunities to join any airline they wanted but do you see yourself moving into a out of the flight stuff and more into photography type stuff or what do you what do you where do you see yourself in 10 years oh my goodness i i wish i wish i knew um so flying has always been you know a passion of mine and i thought that it was going to be the lifelong passion up until I started wildlife photography and it's just thrown a monkey wrench in all of my 10 year plans. Um, I would like to find a way to incorporate them, maybe offer my own tours where I could be the fly out guide and, you know, do the the photography tour thing. So it'd be like a one-stop shop for someone, for instance, you know, if Jason wanted to come to Alaska and do the cat, my thing, it's like, Hey man, not only do I, uh, you know, offer the, the helicopter tour, but you know, I got the photographer brain. So, you know, I kind of have an idea what you're looking for. I feel like, you know, maybe mixing those two together in some some sort or aspect would be uh would be really cool. I don't know the the financial uh gain. You know, I don't know I don't know what that's gonna do, but uh that would be ideal. Well Jason will he'll invest in your helicopter operation. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what, I think that's a really smart approach. And I think you've got you might have something there. You know, I I know we've I've done a few tours, we've talked about them before on the podcast. And to be quite honest, having somebody that has that photography background and knows what a photographer wants and is looking for is super, super beneficial to the folks that are doing the tour. So, you know, I've seen it. Per, I've seen it firsthand. So I think you you might want to keep thinking about that and how that might work, because I think you might be on to something. The other thing I've experienced along that same line is. You know, there's so much commercial production done in Alaska. So it's Animal Planet, National Geographic, BBC, all those guys. And if they have a pilot that understands filmmaking, then it gets to be pretty good because they know that you know what ultimately everybody's right. looking for. And and a helicopter is pretty awesome, right? Because you can land just about wherever. I mean, these fixed wing aircraft are cool. You can go floats or you can go tundra tires or you can do whatever and it gets you in there for sure but you still might have to put on five or ten miles to get to the actual spot whereas with the helicopter like an r44 or whatever i don't know all those little ones like that but they're pretty significant and now with the gimbal technology you you can throw a gimbal on the front of one of the is it r44 is that the four-seater uh, that'd be the 66. So the R44, I think it is four seater, but it's significantly smaller. It's a little bit more underpowered. So you got the 22, 44 and the 66, the 44 and the 66. I'm I'm pretty sure are the four seaters and the 22 is the two seater. I'm not, I'm not a Robbie expert at all, but yeah, I think 44 is the, the four seater. Well, when I win the lottery, I'll, I'll invest in an A star <laughs> for you. There we go. There we go. <laughs> but I think the cool thing would be having that ability too, because then essentially 
you know, you're not necessarily the camera guy, but you are. I mean, you're flying that helicopter and somebody's still running the camera in a gimbal setup, but you still got to be putting them on whatever, whatever oh, you're yeah. shooting. So, I mean, those, so, op- those kind of opportunities are pretty awesome. I mean, now that's, that's kind of what I do, kind of what I do for a living now, you know, running the, the camera sensors that, that we have. It's, it's really no different. Um, the only difference would be what I was looking at. So, I mean, hopefully I'm kind of getting that training in now. Um, I didn't even think about that, you know, maybe getting hooked up with, uh, someone to, to put them on with the, those gimbal helicopters and stuff. So, no, that'd be, that'd be phenomenal. It would be, that's like kind of my, you know, if I had unlimited funds, that's what I would do is I would invest in one of those shot over gimbal setups, which is expensive, right? You're talking like a million dollars for the nice one, but then that, I don't even have a clue what a helicopter would cost to actually carry that amount of weight with a couple of people inside. So you're probably looking at another couple million, probably five, I don't know, $5 million for a helicopter. Who knows? And then, yeah, the real, the real killer is the insurance. So, okay, now you got you, you got your overhead set up, you got everything you need. The insurance alone, like I was talking to a helicopter buddy up here, he runs Robinson Tours. And I think it's something astronomical, like almost a million dollars a year to insure his operation. And I'm like, man, like he gets all his money through utility, utility work, you know, working with the oil fields and stuff. But, uh, right. Just that alone. Uh, speaking along those lines, are you messing around with drones at all? Do you do any drone photography? Just having the helicopter background. I mean, obviously you understand flying really well, so you could probably transition that into drone photography and do some pretty cool stuff. Possibly. Is that something you're looking at? I've tried it. Um, the issue is, is I'm not up to date with the the new regulations, and I've had some pretty bad encounters with some uh, some drones. It's got a, kind of a bad taste in my mouth as an aviator. <laughs> you know, guys flying it where they shouldn't be flying it, and you know me having to react. And you know, we've had some close calls. That's all I'm going to say. With you know tourists coming here in the winter time and not being spun up on you know regulations on where to fly these things and, and flying them in a in a place that puts you know me or my buddies in danger. So I, I've kind of stayed out of the drone game just because I, I have a little bit of a different um, different viewpoint on them because, like I said, I've had some close calls with them. But uh, I see the work that comes out of, out of Alaska, and it's just jaw-dropping. It's beautiful. I just, I just haven't done any. Well, you know, we should use this as an opportunity to, to talk about it because if you are going to fly a drone, you should go get your license. And if you got your license, then you're going to understand those situations that would put Cameron in danger, and you just don't fly in those areas. And I can't tell you, I see it all the time too. And – of course, being a licensed drone operator, I will, if I see somebody out there flying anything anywhere that I know is, well, I just know they don't have a license, right? Because they're doing something that is obviously breaking the rules. So I'll actually go talk to people right away and not, you know, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to educate, but also Alaska, it's so, there's so many aircraft in the air and there's not any one place that you could say, ah, oh, yeah, there's nothing going to be flying here. There very well could be some, you know, fixed wing flying down a valley of a some mountain range, or you could have a you know, helicopter. You know, who knows what's out there? So you just really got to know what you're doing. And there's so many things that you can do as far as research to figure out. Yeah, I can fly here, and I can fly here safely, and I just have this this limit of of height that I can go to. You know, there is a limit, but that's probably too high. You can set your own limit. You can say I'm only going to go 100 feet. Or I'm only going to go 50 feet and just know that you're going to stay out of that safety zone or that interference zone with any sort of fixed wing or helicopter stuff. So I don't know. Just if you're out there flying drones, you should really seriously consider getting your license. And if you're not going to get your license, don't be flying one of the drones that needs to have a license to be flown. You know, there's these little itty bitty ones. Take something like that 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 is legal to fly without a license. And with with wildlife there is some uh there's kind of an ethical dilemma there as well so if you're flying to photograph or film wildlife the harassment laws and you know especially the western states and i would assume in alaska as well you're going to lose your drone you're going to lose your footage you're going to you know lose the ability to fly um and the fines are astronomical so it's it's not something you want to do go harass wildlife just for the sake of a you know, of a clip. Now, if you're going to go get B-roll for your YouTube channel, that kind of thing, that's a great tool. And you're almost obligated to have 
those B-roll shots of the the drone of you know going down the dirt road that kind of thing but yeah with wildlife there's a there's a lot of things to think about there i should say that so, too i don't fly ever shooting wildlife the main reason i got my license was for all the production work commercial work we do and that never involves wildlife and then the other thing is if i am doing it for it it's exactly what you said ron it's just a it's an establishing shot it's to show the habitat or the topography or something like that. We're not shooting wildlife mm-hmm. at all because it is something that it can harass wildlife. I, I see a lot of clips on the internet where it's like, what are you doing shooting these sheep up on the side of the mountain or shooting goats or, you know, chasing a moose or whatever. The one thing that I think isn't as bad, or I don't think it's bad at all. If you can shoot salmon swimming in the, in the river Oh, you know, yeah, you're only 10 shot. feet off the water yeah. and you get to see this massive salmon. It's really hard to see that otherwise, you know, from the air is pretty awesome, but you're not really harassing salmon. I mean, they're, you're 10, 20 feet up off the deck and, and you just get this cool visual. So that kind of oh. wildlife I think is okay. But any, anything on the ground, bears, moose, wolves, whatever, it's just not cool. I, I agree a thousand percent, especially with the salmon. They're so one track minded at that point where you'd be really hard to disturb them doing much of anything. But uh, I've had experiences here in Alaska where, you know, I'll be up on a moose and I'll, I'll be taking images and then no exaggeration, a drone will come down from the heavens and be within 20 feet of this poor moose. And, you know, not only does it ruin, you know, the, the, fo- the photographic opportunity for everybody there, but it, you know, A, it's illegal and B, scares this moose, moose half to death. So um, what I do to cheat when I do my YouTube videos is I, I just use stock footage. And I, I know that's uh, people have their different opinions on it. But um, since I don't personally fly a drone and I, I don't want to get too invested in it, that that's how I get to get around on the YouTube channel is uh, since there are so many people doing it legally and professionally and way better than I could, I just try to use some of their stuff if they're selling it. That's a good point. That's, that's a good, a good thing point. To yep. You know, I had an encounter I'm not going to say exactly where, but it was in Alaska and there was a foreign film crew and what are they doing? They're sending a drone up and I'm actually, this is on the same project shooting for animal planet. I was shooting this black bear with cubs walking up this river and here comes a drone and I just dropped everything and I was picking up baseball sized rocks <laughs> and I was throw, I was chunking rocks at this drone and I, I wish I was a baseball player cause I... I couldn't hit it to save my, but I was praying that I was going to hit that helicopter or that drone because these people just had no clue. And then I even went and turned them in afterwards. Yeah. And, and you know what the response was that I got from the, from the feds? It's a foreign crew. There's nothing we can do about it. We can write them a ticket, but they'll never pay it. And you know, we're just not going to do anything at this point. Oh my goodness. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of, what else I'm seeing that that's really kind of, driving me nuts is people using drones for hunting and uh, I'll, yeah. I'll spin it i'll spin in a little bit so in alaska you're not allowed to use a helicopter at all for hunting because like we talked about earlier it's it's just cheating it's you just fly over there's whatever animal i'm looking for i'm going to fly 100 yards away there's a beautiful muskeg tundra landing i'm going to put it right there and then you got your kill even for fixed wing is that's you know you got to wait 24 hours you know you go out there and you, you spot it but you have to fly a certain distance land give it 24 hours and then you're allowed to hunt what people are doing is they're they're going through this little get around where they're using drones essentially like a helicopter to spot, drop their pin, and then and I'm like watching this happen and I'm like, ah, you guys are killing me. Yeah, there's the whole ethics yeah. thing. You just gotta, you know, just don't take it if you're hunting, don't take a drone. It's just yeah. you know, some people can't handle that temptation. Or I do I'm know surprised. professional crews that will take a drone, but they won't pull it out until they're the last day of their right their shoot mm-hmm. and and when they're not hunting at all and i think that is fine you know but you have to establish that and you have to document that too i see a lot yep. of documentation where they're taking pictures and and having that timestamp on that picture just to say yep. you know what this didn't happen until this last day and we just had to get our footage for our show or our footage for whatever so that's that's a way to get around it it's still probably not the best way, but I, I realize you got to have, you know, just like you were saying, Cameron, you do have to have the shots, but there's plenty of stock out there to pull from. Um, I mean, they, they, they take it incredibly serious up here. So like, for example, if you are caught using, you know, an airplane or a helicopter or a drone or anything like that, and you do end up harvesting an animal illegally, not only do they, uh, you know, fine you for the animal, but they will take everything you used 
they will they will actually remove it from your possession everything you used in the harvesting of that animal so if you used a helicopter you used a trailer to trailer the helicopter the truck to pull the trailer with the helicopter anything you used they will actually remove and i try to explain that to people i'm like guys if you get caught with this drone it's not just going to be a fine but you're going to lose your drone so i mean the is the juice worth the squeeze in some of these instances yep yeah it's the same in wyoming and and i i for one am in favor of that legislation because it the people that are doing that kind of stuff is they're not not helping the resource at all well they're not helping the resource and they're not in it for the right reasons you know what i mean yep yep exactly and it gives it gives everybody a bad name too right exactly yep Yep. So whether you're a photographer or a hunter or whatever, I mean, it's just not cool. You just need, there's just limits. You just need to follow that. Well, let's get off of this, like, pedestal. Yeah, that was way, way <laughs> yeah, tangent. Sorry. <laughs> no, it was my fault. I brought it up. But I was just interested to know if you, you know, just having that helicopter background, you would think a drone would be natural. But I can see why you don't. It totally makes sense. So do you ever leave Alaska to film anywhere else, or do you just pretty much – since you found it in Alaska, is this kind of where you've stayed so far? And and then what are your aspirations? Do you want to go to Argentina and shoot guanacos and mountain lions? Or do you want to go to Africa and shoot elephants and rhinos? Or what? Or are you pretty pretty satisfied staying right in Alaska? I mean, Alaska is pretty awesome too, right? So it's pretty hard to beat that. But what, where do you see yourself going as far as that goes with wildlife photography? Um, just like, like you said, I'm, I'm still pretty, uh, pretty new to Alaska. I'm still, you know, just a little bit over one year to the point where I can't even wrap my head around anything being more important than Alaska. So there's still so much, like there's still so many things on my bucket list of Alaska, um, photo shoots that I haven't really even given much thought to, to what, what's going on outside of Alaska. But, um, a big one for me is I really want to go to Svalbard and I really want to do, uh, the polar bears on Svalbard. And I was, you know, trying to trying to talk my wife into that being the honeymoon trip, but apparently Norway is not a, a destination uh, <laughs> for a honeymoon. So we'll, we'll have to cross <laughs> that that bridge in a few more years. But um, right um, now, I just I really want to icebreaker with twelve other people. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. She's like, you know, what do you think at honeymoon wise? And I'm like, Svalbard's nice this time of year. <laughs> 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 but uh no uh other than that other than that being like my ultimate ultimate trip i i really just want to focus on alaska there's just so much and then you know once you start factoring the the differences in between seasons and the plumage changes and, and the, the different behaviors you get per you know whatever season you're in you could be here it would take a lifetime in my opinion just to properly do alaska justice so i'm just trying to trying to focus on that what's the number one bucket thing in alaska that you haven't done yet i want to do polar bears but uh, I can't figure out a smart way to do that financially. <laughs> so that would be Kaktovic, right? <laughs> yeah, it would be. Yep. But uh, I was I was trying to trying to get smart on that, um, and uh, the pricing, at least you know from an outsider looking in, as I was like, I can't justify that. And you know, I really want winter polar bears. I'm not a huge fan of the polar bears when they're they're on the muddy shores and they're, they're, they look like brown bears. And, you know, people cherry pick them from uh, from boats and stuff. They are powerful images, but I, I really want the winter coat and, you know, everything in my mind that encompasses a polar bear. So I'm still trying to logistically figure that out. But that would be the ultimate shot for me, at least. Now, have you successfully done muskox yet? Oh, my goodness. Throwing some salt in that wound run. <laughs> I, uh, I had the trip all planned. I feel like Jason right now. Payback, right? <laughs> some karma. Um, I had the trip planned in March. And how it was going to work is, uh, I told you my wife is in the, the Alaska National Guard, where Alaska National Guard has a facility in Nome, Alaska, that we were going to fly into, and we were going to just camp out of and do the muskox, because the muskox in the, the springtime are in town. So you just you, you don't have to walk very far. You don't have to do too much. You don't even need a vehicle, really. Um, and I was going to go do the muskox stuff, and then COVID happened. So no, I haven't successfully even seen a muskox, but that's the plan next year. Well, and there's always that potential on the haul road too. If you when you get that trip done, you can. I I know some people that just luck out and they can be an hour outside of Fairbanks and they're seeing muskox, yep. or you could drive the whole road and never see one. So you just never know. I really uh, I want to do the Dempster Highway. Have you looked into the Dempster Highway in Canada? I have. I've never done it, but I I've looked into it a lot. I was thinking about doing that. Um, instead of the Hall Road, actually, I think it's a little bit more improved, and uh, it allows you to go all the way to the the ocean without 
necessarily having to stop and then take whatever tour they have to get you to uh, the Arctic Ocean. So I was looking into that. Um, I'm not sure if muskox are that far east or if that they're that far inland. I don't know, but uh, that would be something I would like to check out too. Yeah, doesn't it go to Tuk to Yuk Tuk or something like that? Is yeah. the name of the town? <laughs> Some alphabet soup. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, that would be a good trip too. We drove by there a couple last year. And I was looking at that road, and it's like, ah, oh, that would be super cool. But that's a whole another week worth oh, of time. Yeah, to, I mean, that's not doing anything. That's just kind exactly. of going out there and coming back. So if you wanted to stop and shoot, you probably need a couple of weeks to do that. Absolutely, just to do it justice, right? I'm thinking at least two weeks. Yeah. Um, what do you guys got going on? What's what's uh, what's your next big trip? What's going on? We have no idea. We don't <laughs> know what we're going to be allowed to do. That's the problem. It's such a weird time. It's just, uh, you know, it's just who would have thought 12 months ago that we would even be talking about this sort of thing in today's world. It's it's nice to have the opportunities close to home. You know, like Jason's got those, you know, great opportunity with some burrowing owls. We've got, you know, a fox, baby antelope, all that kind of stuff going on right now. Mike's got, you know, the mountain species, the goats, the sheep, the elk calves and that kind of thing. So it's nice to have all that close, but you start to feel like, yeah, I've got that. I really was wanting to, you know, like Jason's bear trip. I mean, I I feel for you on that one because yeah. that one that one stung a little bit, but it, and it was the same thing. I had a trip to Svalbard <sighs> that I was gonna do that uh, we actually got because of the restrictions from uh, people coming in from China. So the boat was already paid for. We just had to pay their, their final payment, which is like a quarter of the trip. And so we could have got the whole small bar 10 day trip for 3000 bucks. Oh my goodness. And, uh, and then they called like the day I was going to make a decision. They called and said, Nope, they shut the Island down. There's a couple cases on the Island. They don't want to bring it in. Um, so they're shutting down anybody coming in. So it's just, you know, it's, it's frustrating. You, you kind of understand the people's hesitation and the caution, but it is frustrating because you really, it's tough to plan anything right now. We'd like to, you know, get together and do a shoot, but it's a, it's a tough time to try to get anything planned. I think Absolutely. the silver lining, though, on all of that is it has forced me to do a lot more stuff locally that I would normally not be doing. So I have I would be gone doing some something else. I would be in Alaska or I would be somewhere else. And so I'm, I got those hummingbirds and documented that pretty well. I would have never got that otherwise, you know. So there there is some good things about it. And I think if you are going to take anything away, it just gives you a chance to focus on where you're at and just get it done. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think it's hard. It can be easy to kind of get down and, you know, bummed out about like, for example, my bear trip, but you know, you saw, you got to just be positive and stay positive about things. You know, this will, this will pass hopefully sooner than later and we'll all be back to some sense of normalcy before long, I hope. Um, but yeah. And, and focusing on those local opportunities is, you know, that's what I'm doing to keep myself sane. And, and there's lots of them. And like you said, Mike, I've I've gotten some opportunities that I would have not never had or never focused on or never done if it wouldn't have been for what's going on. So it's got to stay positive. So Cameron, where can people find you on uh, your social media and your YouTube channel? What are they looking for? Uh, absolutely. So on uh, on Instagram, it's uh, Roxbury R O X B E R R Y underscore actual, and um, on YouTube, it's just my name. It's just Cameron Roxbury. Um, and that, that's really it. I don't, I don't really have a website or anything. I've just kind of been doing the Instagram, YouTube stuff, but it's where I'm at. We got in that conversation with Dale. I don't even think you need a website anymore unless you're Ron and selling prints. I mean, it's like, I don't know what good it is. I mean, you can sell prints right off even, uh, Instagram if you want to. I, I think it's a lot harder, but I think you're doing it right. Your YouTube is pretty awesome. People really need to go hit that up because there's a lot of, fun stuff and i think the way you're doing it that's what i was going to ask you before we let you go are you doing all the own, all your editing too a hundred percent that's it's just trial by fire you know I, I have youtube premiere pro on the right screen you know <laughs> how to and then i have premiere on the left and it's just 
painstakingly miserable from back and forth YouTube tutorials. And so I'm still I'm still learning After Effects and everything that goes into it. But slowly but surely, we're going to get there. <laughs> That's amazing, because most people would look at that and say, nah, it's not in the cards for me just to learn all that stuff. I mean, you've went from. Well, obviously, you have the acumen to do some pretty high tech stuff, right? If you're flying Apache helicopters, I would assume <laughs> that there's a lot of brain space required for that. So if you can take <laughs> that brain space and put it into learning how to run a camera, learning how to run Photoshop, learning how to run Lightroom, learning how to run Premiere, and then I don't even ever try After Effects. I get scared when I open up After Effects. So if you're playing with all that, that's that's pretty awesome. And I think, I mean, while your videos aren't like Hollywood quality, which I don't think YouTube is that anyway, I think they're great. I mean, I think you're able to illustrate and I like the way you're doing it, the flow and talking to people and then being able to show a little portfolio as you go through and see some of the images that you were able to get there. It's, it's really good storytelling as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and that's all it is. It's just, it's been a labor of love. You know, I've just been so passionate about what I'm seeing and experiencing that, you know, it's, it's worth the extra 10 minutes on YouTube to be able to share that with people who, you know, maybe are locked up in a, in an urban environment, they, they get no chance to get out and get hummingbirds or Fox or so, especially in a time like this, just sharing this passion with people has just been so, so easy to do, if that makes sense. Awesome. Well, we greatly appreciate you giving us your time, especially on your, on your weekend, on your day off. Uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to shoot together out there one of these days. Absolutely. Be, you guys are ever central. Alaska. Just let me know. You guys absolutely always have somewhere to stay up here. We've been talking about the muskox trip for a long time, so maybe we can make that work for everybody. <laughs> yep, I got, I got us a hanger to stay in. You just let me know. That's perfect. <laughs> just bring a cot. All right. Well, thanks, Cameron. Thanks, everybody, for, for listening. Absolutely, guys. Thank you so much. And thanks to uh, – we, we have a little stranger danger today in Michael's studio as we have hardworking Missy McKenzie – in studio today actually thanks missy for everything that you do to get these shows put together you've been listening to the wild and exposed podcast if you haven't yet please give us a rating and a review and make sure you're subscribed so that you'll get every episode we produce as soon as we drop it and as always thanks for tuning in we're gonna make it someday nothing's gonna get in our way we will be the biggest band in time